and we're back with Talking Law TV and we're here with Doug Andrews and Richard Sanders. Hello. How, How are Michael? you doing? Great. And we're here to talk about what not to do during a divorce. Yeah. So before we get started with the serious stuff, i got to ask you some things. <laughs> so if I get divorced and I'm, I'm out maybe trying to show off, be the little peacock, do I need to go buy one of these? <laughs> Wouldn't hurt. No, it's okay to do one of those. You so if I'm getting divorced, how about maybe one of those? <laughs> and then hide it in a really, really good place. Okay, how, how about if I get one of those? Definitely hide that in a good place. Okay, and, and if I can't do that, should I get one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Just start writing your wife big checks. Okay, yeah. <laughs> now what if it's the woman? Can she go buy one of those? She can. Okay, <laughs> and, or maybe get one of those. She probably needs to hide that one as well. But <laughs> you want to encourage her to do that so that eliminates the greater risk of alimony. Okay. So in, in all seriousness, what's one of the, it's a very difficult time in your life. Uh, you, you, you're, you're breaking a, a vow that you'd agreed to, to last forever, which half the people break. So apparently those aren't worth much. Uh, what should you, what, sh, what are the main do's and don'ts in the process? Well. I mean, the first thing I say, and, and I get a lot of calls where people are flustered and, and they're upset and they're nervous and they're scared, the biggest thing is don't panic. There's a process to the divorce. Everything is going to take time. Nothing's going to happen overnight. There, I know emotions are running high, just don't panic. That's the first and foremost thing not to do. Don't panic. And sometimes folks say, okay, let's get a divorce and they reach an agreement between themselves and they say we don't need no stinking lawyer we got this all worked out except they have no clue what all is required to get it through the judicial process you want to hear a judge groan and that's when the divorce case is called and no lawyer stands up and the judge says oh no now I've got to go through much more explanation I've got to heavy docket and it's going to keep me here two extra hours if all these people don't have lawyers. If they have children, they haven't thought about parenting plans, they haven't gotten all the child support guideline worksheets done, they have no clue whether the child amount, support amount they're going to have is within the guidelines because the judge won't buy it if it's not, and a host of problems. So even if you think you can work it out, you at least need to get a lawyer to help you do some of the paperwork. Uh, we had a case recently where the soldier wanted a divorce and they went to JAG and got a settlement agreement worked out. And they thought they were good to go. There's no kids, nothing to argue about. Settlement agreement said he would no longer get any of her BAH money. She wouldn't have to pay him any money because he was civilian. She was the one in the military. And they go to court, judge says, well, where's your proof of service? He was never served. He left, went back to California. And now he's disappeared. He won't cooperate, can't get service on him, so no divorce until that happens. So we got involved and got him served. And sure. Richard, <laughs> Richard got kind of an ugly phone call from him once a personal service uh, was made. But anyway, those are the pitfalls of trying to do it on your own. It's just very difficult in today's world. Okay. What if the whole thing's a surprise to you and the sheriff shows up and here's your summons? Guess what, buddy? Sure. And, and I think... What should you not do? Well, the first thing not to do is don't lose your temper with the sheriff. I mean, that, that seems pretty obvious, but uh, a lot of the times with service, a private process server can serve you the papers. And Mr. Andrews alluded to it earlier. Uh, in this particular divorce, the process server uh, served the defendant with the papers, came out, gave him the papers, um, he saw it was a complaint and he lost his cool. He called me, gave me an earful, uh, ran through the whole gambit of uh, obscene words to say the least. Uh, so the one thing that I'll say is don't lose your cool. Uh, when you get the papers, take them, contact your attorney, let your attorney walk you through the process. I recently had a divorce case where uh, the, the wife uh, had set up an exchange with the children to meet the husband. A private process server gave the husband the divorce papers. He refused to take them, threw them on the ground, made a huge scene, a lot of obscene words. And the, down, the downside of all that was the kids were in the car. The kids saw all that. So the whole time throughout the divorce, I heard about how my client lost his temper, how he was doing all this, and how he was acting, and how the kids witnessed it. So the biggest thing is don't lose your cool. Take the papers. If you're going to get served, just take them 
and then give them to your attorney and let your attorney explain them to you. Would you agree that throwing the papers on the ground, the man is, or the person is still served? Yeah, absolutely. So if he doesn't take them, he's at a disadvantage because once that private process server or the sheriff gives those papers to you, it doesn't matter if you pick them up or take them or not. You're served and that starts the clock for you to respond. And if you leave them there, then your lawyer doesn't have a copy of what they need to respond to. And the deadline to respond is what? Uh, generally, well, it's 30 days. You have 30 days to respond with filing an answer. Okay, and based on some news items from last summer, you probably shouldn't make a lot of phone calls to answer <laughs> machines. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Taping, uh, and I, I believe because of those tapes, I'm getting a lot more divorce calls where they're saying, I taped him, he's yelling at me, I taped this, I taped that. But the one thing I caution my clients is against, is against limiting the amount of tapes that they have. I recently had a case uh, where the parties were taking pictures, they were recording everything, and the kids were involved. And the judge got very upset that every time the parties came into court, a different recording was being played, different pictures were being showed, and it was just making things a lot worse than they needed to be. Okay. What happens, what should you not do if you're, you're given a temporary restraining order? I think the first thing to do is read the order. Don't break the order, okay? I get a lot of calls with, um, and it, it's typically men that receive the restraining order, and they immediately call their wife, and they, they bless her out, and they do all that. Well, that just makes things a lot worse. So read the restraining order, and don't violate it. Take the restraining order to your attorney. He knows how to read it. He knows to get around the issues to where things can be addressed. Because typically when you get a restraining order, there is something serious going on. Um, the wife usually goes to the judge and says, hey, here's why I'm scared. Here's what's happened. Here's a family violence issue. I think you need to keep him away from me. And so, you know, just don't violate the order. I mean, it's plain Some, and simple. Sometimes we've seen where it's done just for a tactical advantage and there's really not an issue there that requires a restraining order. In that case, a restraining order, if it's just to preserve the peace, should say both parties are restrained from harassing and abusing each other, as opposed to falsely claiming the other one is doing it just for an advantage that that might or might not give. Are, are the judges sort of generally up to speed on, on some of these ploys? Like, I, I've heard of one where the woman wanted a restraining order because he has a lot of guns. Sure. It's like, well, you know, unless she's wearing horns and running through the woods, I don't think she's going to be in danger. Uh, a lot of the judges, uh, most of them were practicing attorneys, so they've seen this. You know, the longer they're sitting judges, they hear more cases, they see it. I recently had a case where the judge wanted to hear directly from the wife why she was scared, wanted to see the police report. Those are all things that you need to prove. And I guess the more serious the restraining order, the more you need to show. And in fact, what a lot of judges do is they will issue a temporary restraining order, but then give it an immediate court date to where the defendant can come in and argue his position and say, hey, this is unfounded, this is unreasonable. Okay. We begin with the premise that the judge expects both parties to just be adult about it. That's all. Don't play games with the children. Um, if child support isn't paid on time, uh, mom may want to withhold visitation that Friday evening. That's wrong. Visitation is unrelated to payment of child support and the judge will be upset with both parties. Him for not paying, her for not allowing the benefit to the child of the visitation. So comply. It's going to happen. Divorce, if one party says the marriage is over, it's going to happen. So don't stress each other out by playing silly games. Okay, well, thank you both. I know you'll both be back for viewer mail. We'll be back with Gene Brooks talking about pharmacy liability right after this.